first you talk about the injustices which, in, which prevail in the so-called communist countries and then the free societies which exist in the capitalist countries and the wealth that has been created uh, there. But you restrict your arguments uh, to the Western European countries, the United States and Japan. What you fail to point out is that most of the countries in the world are capitalist. That is, the means of production are owned privately or the accumulation of wealth is, is, is privately accumulated. Most of these countries have severely repressive governments and most of them suffer from huge unemployment rates, hunger and poverty. If we look at India as compared to China, which has twice as many people, and under its system, the Chinese system, has been able to achieve things for the masses of people which India could not even consider. The same uh, thing would goes... You, would you come to your question, please? All right. Just two more points, because I've... Excuse me, I'd like a, a little bit of uh, uh, free speech myself. That's okay. That's okay. We don't want to deny you free speech. We All just right, want to have as much. many people as possible. Thank you very much. And I, right. think we've I agree with you, so let me finish. Sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the problem which a lot of us feel is, first, you did not mention in, in terms of the countries you were pinpointing, such uh, barbarous countries as South Africa and Zimbabwe. And in terms of giving uh, your appraisal of the riches uh, that have been uh, accumulated in the Western so-called democracies, capitalist democracies, uh, I would like you to give us a, an honest evalu of evaluation of just how these countries got so rich so quick and that direct relationship of that to the fact that there were uh, slaves that worked free labor and the wealth that was created in this society being a direct product of that relationship and also of the colonial relationships of the Western European countries and the wealth which they bled out of the people in their col colonial domain. I will be glad to answer those questions. First of all, there's a sense in which every country in the world is capitalist. Soviet Union is capitalist. Every country in the world has large capital under control. And the real question is, of course, the organization whereby the capital is controlled. In the Soviet Union, it is controlled by the state or by officials of the state. In the second place, I uh, have been talking for an hour. I would like to talk to you for 10 hours. In a full discussion, I would certainly agree with you that capitalism is not a sufficient condition for freedom. It's a necessary condition for freedom. I never said that wherever you had capitalism, you had freedom. I never said that. I never made that statement. I made the opposite statement. Wherever you had freedom, you had capitalism. Capitalism is a necessary condition for freedom, but not a sufficient condition for freedom. In addition, you need relatively broad access to capital and a relatively free market. Again, relatively. You need com competition. I usually refer to it as competitive capitalism to distinguish it from certain kinds of systems which have been capitalist and have all of the bad qualities that you describe. In the second place, because I want to, don't want to take too much time, to go to your final points. In the second place, it simply is not true that the enormous increase in the well-being of the free countries of the West arose out of slavery. Slavery was a blot on our escutcheon, there is no question. And of course, it was a disgrace to this country to have had slavery as long as it did. But if you take Britain, which did not have slavery, if you, it, uh, I'm going to go to the colonies, that's the next point. I'm trying to take one point at a time. The gentleman made two separate points. One had to do with colony, one had to do with slavery, and one had to do with colonies. Britain did not have slaves. Japan did not have slaves in the hundred years since the Meiji Restoration. Hong Kong today does not have slaves. And you ask yourself, if you want to know how people feel, ordinary people feel, about different systems, you ask how they vote with their feet. And you ask whether it's Hong Kong that has to put up police to keep people from Hong Kong going into China, or it's China that has to put up police to keep people from China going into Hong Kong. So look at the way people vote with their feet before you judge which society gives them better conditions. But in any event, In any event, let me go to the final point of, colonia, of colonies. In the first place, it's not true that the wealth or the benefits of the West derive from exploiting the colonies. The facts are against you. 
The reason why you say that is because it is so hard for people to get out of the notion that life is a zero-sum game. They think if one man benefits, another must lose. But in a free market, both people can benefit. Now, if you take the case of Africa, the wheel, the wheel had not been invented in parts of Africa by the end of the 19th century. The number of people in Africa and their average conditions of life in Africa have, been enorm have grown enormously as a result of their contacts with the West. Don't know your history, sir. Yeah, don't well, I would say you don't know your facts, sir. They, uh, in, the case, in the case of India, which is a very famous case, if you look again at the facts, all of the studies have shown that it cost Britain more to maintain India. These are some famous studies by Jacob Viner, which went into the details of it in great detail. It, colonialism has always cost the mother country more than it ever gotten any direct or indirect economic benefits. So far as India was concerned, the history of India is divided into three periods. The period of British rule in the 19th and early 20th century, when there was very real progress in the standard of life of the people of India. The period of the 20s and the 30s, when there was a great struggle against Britain and for independence, when there was essential stagnation in India and there was no growth. The period since the creation of independence in 1948, when you have had a highly centralized government, when unfortunately it was Harold Lasky and not Adam Smith, who was the most respected intellectual figure in India, when, India, when the Indian people have, have lost, not improved, when the average amount of food and so on has been going down, not up. The people of India have been worse off under independent, non-colonial government than they had been before. So colonialism, well, first of all, where is, do you have colonialism today? You have the classic, the classic colonialism behind the Eastern, behind the Iron Curtain. You have Russia, which is a master country. I mean, uh, not the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, but Russia, which is a master country with a great colony around it within the Soviet Union in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary. That's the great example today of your classic kind of colonialism. The United States, with trivial exceptions, has never been a colonial country. It did have Philippines. It had Philippines for a while. Cuba was not a colony of the United States. In any event, in any event, you need a sense of proportion. In the period between, uh, the, uh, between the revolution in 1776 and 1898, the U.S. had no colonies. And yet the U.S., that was a period of the greatest growth and the greatest economic development of the United States.